Okay, so welcome to Community Action for Nature webinar. We're thrilled that you're here. And um, I'm just going to let people arrive as they as we come on in. While you're doing that, if you use your chat function on the bottom screen and let us know what community group you're from, um, that would be an exciting thing to see how many people are going to be joining us from across the uh, across the county. So um, we're just going to be starting and we'll just let a few more people join us. We've got 33 participants so far. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think we can go ahead and start the evening. So welcome to the first of the webinar series for the Community Action in Nature. My name is Sue O'Regan and I am the uh, Adult Learning Community Officer for Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, basically, I run all the adult learning programs. We have about 50 to 60 programs per year. Um, and some of you may have joined us before. But I'm also here with my community hat on because I'm, I am the, uh, the representative for my, uh, the chairman of my residence association for about 15 years. And with that, uh, we have raised awareness for many different things, but the most important one that we've done is the um, Blue Heart Campaign. Some of you will, <laughs> some of you will have um, introduced that in your own communities, and you'll see, just like us, that it was a wonderful initiative. It opened communication networks. Not only did our verges look fantastic, but it allowed people to really understand what community and nature was all about and how, we, how important it is for community to get nature moving. So that's a little bit about me, but more importantly, let's talk about the housekeeping. Um, most of you will have used Zoom before um, and tonight um, with your chat function, you need to know that that's gonna be uh, available for everyone to see. And so if you wanna use that, if you have special information that you'd like people to know about, or again, tell us a community group that you're with, please do so. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, which we'll have questions at the end of the sessions, please use your question and answer button, which is on the bottom. Um, and again, all of this is going to be recorded. So if you do um, have to sneak out early, or if there is a problem with your internet, please don't worry that um, everything's going to be recorded and it'll be available um, on YouTube within a day or so. So I'm just going through my housekeeping, the chat functions. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to be hoping to keep on time, should be finishing by about 7.15 this evening. Um, and really it's important for you to know this is the first of a few seminars that we're going to be hosting um, with in the community for the Wild Communities Program. Um, and it's just, as you are all community people, you know the importance of community and sharing knowledge and examples. And what we wanna to do today is to, to do that by bringing in some fantastic presentations um, and also hearing from you. So that's what these are gonna be all about. Tonight, we're gonna to start off with um, a presentation by Tom Butterworth, and he is the head of ecology at WSP. So I'm gonna hand over to him. Enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, Sue. Let me just share my presentation. Uh, it's a real delight to be here this evening, so thank you so much. Um, okay, just double checking that that's all coming through for everybody. Now I've lost the chat. So if someone can tell me that that's all okay, that'd be great. Yeah, we're there. I can see you there. Brilliant, good. Okay, so um, thank you so much for the warm introduction and really lovely to be here. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Tom Butterworth. I head up a team of ecologists and uh, uh, arboreal culturalists and uh, natural capital experts, biodiversity experts across the UK in a, in a large consultancy called WSP. Um, I'm not going to say much more about that. Um, I want to get into the meat of uh, what we're going to talk about. What I wanted to do today is give you an overview of some of the um, uh, very high scale, large um, initiatives that are going on at an international level um, and uh, playing out through down to the local level um, and talk about some of the tensions and opportunities perhaps uh, around uh, the climate agenda and the biodiversity agenda. 
But first of all, a little bit of context. Um, so we have, we're living in uh, changing times. So there's a piece of work that's been done and you can have a look at this. The, the website is linked to at the bottom of this uh, page as well. So um, you'll be able to get that through the slides. Um, but uh, this work's called The Great Acceleration and it's just flagging or identifying uh, the rate of change that we've seen over a whole range of different things. And this is just a subsample of, of what they've got on their website. Um, but a huge range of different things that we're seeing shift dramatically, whether that be telecommunications use, transportation, uh, tourism, fish catch, tropical forest loss, um, an awful lot of them accelerating very, very rapidly, especially since 1950. Um, this means that we are living in a very different time from our parents and grandparents in terms of the environment we live in, uh, but also that our children and grandchildren will be living in a radically different space and uh, from where we are today. Um, Obviously, one of the big changes that we're seeing is climate change, um, and perhaps this goes without saying, um, but some really significant shifts, and we've seen a summer of some massive challenges, uh, whether it be uh, heat waves uh, across Europe or flooding uh, in parts of Southeast Asia. Um, uh, the fires in California seem to be an annual event now. Um, you know, the, so the massive shift going on in terms of our climate. And this is played out in terms of um, uh, people's understanding of, of the importance of this, uh, the, the climate change. So this was a, a survey we did a couple of years ago, right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're asking people uh, what their, the, the key greatest concerns were. And, and unsurprisingly, COVID was number one, the NHS number two. The economy came down below that. Um, I think we may get a different response now if we asked everybody, um, but climate change came uh, into a strong fourth place. Um, and you can even see the natural environment coming up there almost in the same position as, as schools and education, which is uh, much higher than it used to be a few years ago. So we've got a real awareness that this is crucial, running right the way through our society to people like um, Sir David Attenborough saying that climate change is humanity's greatest threat in thousands of years, which I don't think any of us would deny. It's not the only threat though. We're also losing biodiversity at an alarming rate faster than any rate in human history. Um, these are a whole load of stats from uh, across the world and um, they show decreases, um, uh, massive decreases in, in biodiversity since 1970. So even more recent. Um, in the UK, um, even though we are, um, uh, we started at a pretty low baseline um, back in 1970. Um, it wasn't our peak of biodiversity back in 1970. Um, uh, we still have seen something like between 60 and 80 percent abundance of our species decreasing since 1970. So, so if it, that was the 80 percent, the upper limit, um, and these are for the priority species. So these are the species that are that are uh, deemed of important for our conservation action uh, across the UK. 149 of them assessed. Um, but if that is an 80 percent loss, if we saw 20 of them in 1970, what would that be? Four of them in in uh, 2018, and by 2050. Um, we're looking at near a 95% loss. Um, so a massive loss. And, and the good news, if there is any, is that those bar charts show that the rate of decline is slowing. So we're losing things more slowly. Not really great news. Just as we're uh, impacting on nature in this incredibly uh, uh, profound way, we're recognizing that the uh, nature underpins our economy. So there's a whole load of reports now, and you may well have seen the desk up to review that came out from uh, the government uh, a year and a half ago, um, setting out that uh, we require 1.6 Earths to maintain the current living standards. But there's other pieces as well coming from the World Economic Forum to the World Bank. So this isn't you know, uh, people like myself, trained ecologists or people, you know, like um, NGOs stepping forward saying this is important. We've been flagging this for a long time. This is the World Economic Forum and the World Bank saying that 50% of global GDP is directly dependent on nature. The other 50% of our GDP is indirectly, what this report doesn't say, indirectly dependent on nature. We only have to stop eating for a little while to realize that that's the case. So really, really important. And, and what we're finding as well is that these two pieces are interrelated. The climate challenge and the biodiversity challenge are interrelated. 
this is a, a piece of work that was done by um, uh, a little while ago by the people that you can see the link at the bottom there. It's in Nature, showing that um, if you take the dark blue line, let's see if I can uh, use a pointer here. So the dark blue line is our uh, our trajectory under one scenario. Um, if you add in nature-based solutions, so using nature to mitigate climate change, to uh, suck down carbon, um, then we can start to see this dotted line is possible. Likewise, this light blue line, so this is the best trajectory that we could possibly hit. Um, I think we're probably past that already, but this is still going above 1.5 degrees and then, and then dipping back down again. If you add really um, uh, doubling down on d delivering gains for nature uh, that also benefit uh, 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 carbon absorption, then you can see this dotted line, uh, about almost half a degree difference. Um, so really important impact that nature can have. And as a result, loads of people are jumping on this and saying, great, what we'll do is we'll plant a load of trees, because that's the answer, isn't it? Let's plant trees, and that absorbs a whole load of carbon, and uh, job done. Um, there's, there's some issues with this. Um, one of the issues is that the trees that their people are talking about planting very often aren't um, necessarily uh, the trees that we might want for nature. Um, this nature-based solutions is something that an awful lot of companies are looking into. A lot of organizations are trying to drive forward, but very often it's planting the wrong trees in the wrong place, planting uh, lots of eucalyptus trees all over uh, a part of Southeast England won't be the way to absorb a whole load of carbon um, because what's going to happen is we'll have other knock-on effects that cause us massive problems, whether that be uh, flood risk or uh, impacting on soil or um, uh, other negative impacts. Now, if we step back from that sort of simple idea of a nature-based solution from just planting a load of trees, actually the IUCN, that's the International Union for Conservation of Nature, I may have got that acronym wrong, you can look it up and correct me in the chat, um, they have set out a clear nature-based solution target, it's quite wordy, uh, sorry, definition, it's quite wordy, but it sets out that um, nature-based solutions should be trying to deliver multiple benefits, should be trying to deliver healthy ecosystems um, that target major cha challenges like climate change, like dealing with disaster risk um, uh, reduction, decreasing our flood risk, for example, uh, increasing water security. So, um, this is really important looking at this integrated solution. And this is evident from a lot of the work we've done. So now bringing this down further to, uh, this is a local authority level, we find that looking at zero target, um, net zero targets for local authorities, we find um, there's some really interesting stuff where we can electrify the fleet, we can uh, add green gas, 5% um, green gas into the mix, we can uh, consolidate the offices, etc., to try and decrease our um, carbon emission. And this green bar on the left hand side is what we want to get to. And you can see the uh, management of land for carbon lockup and development plan for additional authentic offsetting, um, including waste contracts. So that's including some bits of tree planting. We've got 200 uh, uh, tons of carbon that we can absorb. But the key piece here is this big piece on the uh, uh, side here, the 2080 tons of carbon. And this is existing green space lockup. So what does that mean? Well, it might be planting trees, but it's actually the crucial thing we need to do there to deliver that net zero target is manage our land in a way that's absorbing carbon. And that means managing our farmland that's absorbing carbon. If we plant and do very intensive arable land uh, production at the moment, we're going to be releasing carbon very significantly. Um, whether that just be because of the fertilizer input or for other reasons in terms of soil loss into the, the watercourse. Whereas actually, there's some really good evidence now showing that we can get the same level of uh, farm productivity um, while de uh, uh, capturing carbon, storing that in the soils and actually not losing the, the soils out into the rivers and so on. And this is really, really crucial because you can see here, without doing that, without shifting the way that we're looking after land, we simply can't meet our net zero targets. Or another way to put this, if we turn this round, we can't deliver our path to a nature positive outcome. So enhancing and restoring nature without thinking about climate change. And you can see here this, this graph from Global Biodiversity Outlook. It's um, obviously uh, quite 
general, but uh, you can see climate action having a significant role here in terms of alongside conservation action, uh, reducing other drivers, uh, sustainable productivity and so on. So there we go, we've got biodiversity and our biosphere underpinning our society, underpinning our economy, job done, lovely, solved. Uh, biodiversity and climate crisis need to be dealt with together. Uh, and um, if we look at them as an integrated solution, then uh, we can find a way through. That could be the end of my presentation, but isn't the end of my presentation. Um, because there's some really crucial pieces that we need to think about around how biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis play out together. And this is really crucial at a global scale. It's really crucial at a local authority scale and it's really crucial locally. And what I want to talk about in the next eight minutes or so is scale, reversibility of the, the impacts we're having, resilience, which is not so much a difference between these things, uh, climate and biodiversity, but something that, that joins those two together. Uh, targets and delivery and timescales. So first of all, carbon can be released anywhere and it will have a global impact, And th but the impact will be un not dependent on where that carbon's released. We can release it all here and it will still be Pakistan that's impacted or Bangladesh that's impacted by flood risk. Um, uh, that is, is really significant and we need to think about that in our climate plans so that we're really taking that seriously. But biodiversity loss is quite different. Biodiversity loss does have a global impact. Uh, losing the Amazon rainforest makes our chicken cheaper because we can produce soya cheaper. But, but the main people that are impacted, the main communities that are impacted by biodiversity loss are the local community. And my picture is of the Amazon, but that is true in Plymouth or in uh, Brighton, wherever we might be, Tower Hamlets in London, I'm, I, I spend a lot of time in London, and Tower Hamlets, one of the poorest areas in Europe, uh, they're, if they're losing green space, the impact is much more significant than if another part, uh, uh, perhaps of the Cotswolds, where there might be green space lost or biodiversity lost. So this is really, really crucial. The local impacts have a direct social impact for biodiversity loss. And it's really important we recognise that. It's quite different from climate change. Um, the second point, the reversibility, we know we're going to go above 1.5 degrees, um, we will be able to draw that back over time, and we will be able to uh, mitigate some of these impacts. I say that, that's assuming we don't hit and pass a whole load of tipping points with loads of methane being released, etc, which we may be passing. So um, yes, there is some reversibility there. Likewise, there is some reversibility for biodiversity loss, but every species that's extinct is lost forever, no matter what the people trying to restore mammoths to the Arctic tundras tell you, we are not going to really restore them. We'll get a woolly elephant that, that's wandering around, perhaps. But um, if we lose a species, it's lost forever. So we need to act now. This is really crucial. Another piece that I think is similar between these two pieces, and this is true globally as it is true locally, the people that are impacted by both climate change and biodiversity loss, most will be the poorest in our communities, the poorest globally, and will have the least resilience financially to be able to deal with that. You know, uh, some of us will be able to go on holiday. If our local place isn't very green, we can go on holiday somewhere nicer. Some of us will be able to, if we're lucky enough, to be able to afford nice green spaces to live in. That's absolutely not the case for some of the poorest in our communities. And that's true globally as it is true locally. And we must, must act on that to make sure that access to high quality, biodiversity, rich green space is a right, not a nice to have. Targets. There's a whole load of simple targets for, biodiversity, uh, for climate change. We can say net zero is simple. Uh, it's not simple, but we can say that we're delivering, we're, we're at net zero for a company, we're at net zero for a, a country level, and uh, for an individual, even for a sandwich. Um, although I would want to check the back of the label quite carefully on that one. You know, and WSP is a company, we're setting our targets, we're trying to uh, follow the science-based targets, and we can do that as a company. Biodiversity, that's not the case. You can't have a net zero target or even a net positive target that's just the same for everybody. It's not going to be the same for uh, locally from nationally. And you might have a target nationally for 30% of the globally to be protected or nationally to be protected for biodiversity. 
what does that mean locally? Um, maybe most of that 30% is in other countries. We may need to make sure that we're not losing our green space locally as well, and we need to understand what that means. Um, that could be quite different requirements in different places. We have got targets coming through. We've got a target for all businesses coming through. This is happening later in the year. COP, so we, the COPs are the convention of for the, uh, of the parties. We've got a climate one that happened in Glasgow last year. We've got another climate one happening this year. We've got a one in 10 year COP this year in Montreal in December for biodiversity. And that's gonna play out a whole load of targets that we play back into our local communities. Back in 1992, when this first kicked off, that set led to a whole load of biodiversity action plans being developed at a local level. I'm really hopeful that we get some uh, real impetus off the back of the international agreements here, and they're played out at a country level and then at a local level to actually get action happening. And here's an opportunity to go and talk to all of your businesses locally about this. I don't know how this is going to play out in the UK yet, but if this target does play out, it means that not only our, our local authorities going to have to think about this. Not only are our uh, communities got an opportunity to think about this, but businesses need to take a front foot and really start acting on biodiversity. My last point um, before I sum up is that the timescales are different. One of the climate week back in, um, so yes, what I mean by this is uh, last week, or was it the week before, New York, there was climate week. And one of the sort of strap lines that was being thrown around was let's just get this done. You can imagine a situation where we've got the renewable energy sorted, we've got the um, our, uh, uh, our supply chain sorted so that they're all net zero, all of the businesses are committing to it, we've got farming uh, producing the same amount of food that we need as well as our energy and our water management and so on that we need from land and it's and we've got the carbon story sorted and our economy is a uh, a, a carbon positive uh, economy, absorbing carbon, and it's done. That's never going to be the case for nature. We are going to need to continue to look after nature. We're going to need to continue to think about how we support places for nature forevermore, which may sound really depressing. There's another side to that I think is really positive. The other side to that is we are going to continue getting benefits from nature. If we create these really great places, we're going to continue getting benefits for generation to generation to generation. You know, it'll be our grandchildren that are saying, thank you for putting these green spaces in, because that's where I want to go out and walk. That's where I decrease my stress. That's where I deal with whatever new uh, health impacts we might be having. Those green spaces are going to benefit us and benefit the next generation and the generation after. So climate change and biodiversity must be dealt with together from global right the way through to local. We need to think about these local impacts, especially for biodiversity, because if we lose biodiversity locally, it impacts the communities locally. And when we're acting globally, we need to think about that in terms of climate change as well. So we can bring that together. Some of these changes, changes are reversible, but not all of them are. We need to act now to make sure that we're avoiding those irreversible changes. And we need to recognize that the poor are hit most strongly by climate change and biodiversity, and that all of us, all of us have a role in helping to address that. Targets for biodiversity and climate change are complicated and messy, but understanding and translating those national targets will come out of this, the agreements at the end of the year from this biodiversity nature COP that will be embedded at an England level, um, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales as well, and then down to local authorities and down to communities. Understanding those and understanding how we can help deliver those will be really important in the new year. And we need to think about the timescales we're working on so that we reap the benefits for that over the long term. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. A very quick overview of some of the tensions and opportunities on both climate and biodiversity challenges. Well, Tom, that was fantastic. Thank you. A, a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm going to take the positives from that because really I think a lot of, you know, it really does boil down to community groups at the lower level that can move up. Um, 
Don't forget that uh, we are going to be doing question and answers at the end. So if you would like to put some questions to any of our panelists, please use your, uh, your Q&A function. Um, and if you would like to share with us where you're from or any additional information, use your chat function, but make sure that you are sending that to everyone. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, now we're going to be moving over to Sarah Jane Chimawandra. She is uh, the Chief Executive for Surrey Wildlife Trust. Welcome. Thanks very much indeed, Sue. And uh, I'll just uh, share my slides. Hopefully you can just give me a thumbs up to make sure that that's all looking okay. Um, so we, we have your, there we go. That looks perfect. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so really fantastic, Tom. Thank you for that, uh, that overview that you gave us there. Um, Tom and I have been uh, working in this arena together over the years, probably for about the last 15 years. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about initially is probably just continuing that slightly challenging theme of uh, why it matters and, and how difficult things um, are looking at the moment. But then I'm gonna hopefully finish with a slightly more positive outlook in terms of, of what we can do about it. I'm really grateful that you've joined us for this um, series of webinars. And this is very much from the perspective of how can we help you to deliver nature in your local areas. So it's very much about um, us helping, facilitating, supporting, um, as well as delivering outcomes on the ground. And anything that you feel will help you to do that are the things that we want to hear about. Because biodiversity loss and climate change, as Tom has just outlined, are inextricably linked. But we are also very, very clear that the economy and our health are also inextricably linked. So we cannot really separate these, uh, these four things out. If we want to have a healthy economy, if we want to have a healthy society, we must have that underpinned by um, a healthy biodiversity, a healthy planet uh, with ecosystems that are restored and connected. And we must make sure that we um, reduce the impacts of climate change as much as we are able to, uh, both through uh, mitigation, but also through adaptation, which I'll mention um, a little bit more in a minute. But it's, I think, worth just pausing for a moment and thinking about the scale of the challenge that we have in front of us. Um, I've worked in conservation now for over 25 years. Many of you will have been involved um, in your local spaces or in a, in a professional context. And things look very challenging at the moment. We are, as Tom said, one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, and uh, that decline is continuing. Uh, the long term targets that we've uh, signed up to uh, through govern government uh, to protect 30% of our land by 2030. Um, it's good to have signed up to those targets, but actually there's the risk that even if we achieve that, we could still be seeing a loss of nature during that time. And obviously many of you will have seen most recently um, the very worrying changes in policy that the government has proposed over the, over the last two or three weeks, and which the wildlife trusts, um, other environmental NGOs, but critically other landowners, farmers um, and businesses are all coming together and asking um, actually for a reversal of many of those policies because we really do need to work together if we are going to uh, achieve a successful society um, underpinned by healthy nature. And much of what Tom said applies to uh, Surrey. You, many of you will have seen this before. We know that in Surrey we have lost or, or are losing at least a third of our species. And what you can see in front of you there are just some examples of those that we have already lost from the county. We cannot continue to be um, having these losses, these declines in species and expect everything to be okay. We will reap tipping points beyond which we cannot recover 
And so it's really important that if we are going to achieve the outcome that we're looking for, and you can see there this sort of vision of a connected landscape where we've got uh, not only woodlands, but meadows, rivers, a variety of habitats where people can live and work um, and enjoy uh, quiet time, recreational opportunities. If we're going to achieve that vision, and if we're going to achieve it within a realistic time scale, we really need to be uh, making active progress towards this with every single thing that we do. And that's where you representing our communities are so important because you are able to reach out across the county into your spaces in a way that a single organization such as the Wildlife Trust on its own could never do. So that's why when we look to the future, we're very much looking at how do we create that nature recovery network for Surrey. And although um, we, we look at that from the perspective of where are the best opportunities to connect nature, to have more uh, nature, to make sure it's bigger and it's looked after so it's in better quality. And ultimately, we want to see that across the whole of the county. We want to make sure that we look after our core areas that are already protected and have been looked after for many years um, to make sure that they're in good condition. Connecting those areas is critical and this is why you'll see um, things such as river projects and hedgerow projects, road verge projects are really ideal for getting this theme of connection coming through. And that connection relates not only to nature but also uh, to people and making sure that the people and the communities that are living around these green spaces are connected to them. And if we get this right, it will support a healthy economy, it will provide jobs, it will provide opportunities for business. These things are not separate from each other, they are inextricably linked. And so what we're looking at is using those Lawton principles and asking you to imagine the various areas within your local communities, whether it's a nature reserve, whether it's a park, whether it's your own garden, uh, whether it's a field margin or a hedge, whether it's your school grounds, all of these provide opportunities for us to actually bring nature back into our environment and bring it together. And that's what we're looking at achieving. Surrey Wildlife Trust has articulated this in a really, uh, I think, quite simple way and hopefully something which will resonate with you. We've set this target of making sure that 30% of land is protected, connected and managed for nature by 2030 in Surrey. Just to give you an idea of where we are at the moment, uh, Surrey Wildlife Trust manages approximately 3% of land in Surrey. So there's a huge 97% that we've got to work with people and understand how we can deliver nature together in those areas. So 30% is a quite challenging target in terms of uh, achieving that by 2030. And what we're really keen to do is mobilize people, mobilize all of you who have given up time this evening to come and listen to how you can do it in your own local patch. And that's very much about empowering our local people to take action for nature. We all have to make a difference now. We can't wait uh, anymore for things to happen. We do have a Surrey uh, Nature Recovery Network. We've been working on this for many years and I'm sure Tom, who originally did this, uh, this work in Oxford will, will recognize this approach. But these are the biodiversity opportunity areas in Surrey. In effect, they have identified those core areas and the opportunities to connect them across the county. And that's what's represented by the green areas, but really importantly, the grey areas represent our urban environment. And a very recent piece of work that's been done that you can see highlighted there is some mapping which looks at how can we create those opportunities for nature and that connectivity through our urban environment as well. So in fact, we're very well placed in Surrey to actually start implementing that connection and recovery of nature because we have a lot of policy and a lot of um, evidence that underpins how we want to approach it. 
our work is very much about supporting communities, parish councils, local authorities. Um, citizen science is an increasingly important part of what we do. Um, supporting people with the training that they need, uh, whether it's through community nature hubs, whether it's through uh, information sharing and online talks. Um, all of this is about knowledge exchange, helping people to understand how and what to do um, in order to create nature in their in their environment. Really important to recognize that this is very much a two way thing, because it is just as much for us to learn from our communities and from others how to do this um, as it is for us to provide information. Um, it's also really important that we recognize the power of our voice. And I think that's been something that's come to the fore, certainly over the last few weeks. Many of you will have seen um, the very, very strong campaign that's uh, developed across a wide group of, if you like, those with the uh, natural environment, um, with an interest in the natural environment. And our voice can be very powerful and it's important that we continue to use it. And we use it through campaigns, but we also use it through stories um, and through connecting with nature, both on an individual level, but also as communities, as businesses, as organizations. This is an example, this some of you may have may even be involved with this project, but this is an example of the work that we've been doing uh, through our Hedgerow Her Heritage Project. And what I wanted to mention here is some of the aspects of delivering nature in the community, which are really important. Um, having the ability to visually represent what we're trying to achieve is really critical. So increasingly, we use um, storyboards, such as the one that you can see in front of you, to show what you've got in your local community, where are the best places to connect it, and how do we go about doing that. And as I mentioned earlier, looking at how we can train our local uh, communities, how we can support and help that knowledge development to allow us to go out and survey, for example, hedges, also really critical and you can see here it does have an impact on the ground um, in this particular example over 300 hedges surveyed uh, amounting to nearly over 27 kilometers um, looking at working with partners on land extending over 1900 hectares and planting over 200 uh, over two i wish it was 200 over two kilometers of hedgerow so it does actually make a difference on the ground when we come together uh, and use our energy and our effort in a targeted way and another really uh, interesting example of that is through biodiversity net gain we, um, as a county, have obviously experienced quite a significant development pressure um, in recent, well, probably over the last 30 years, and are likely to continue to do that. So one of the things that's really important is recognising that where damage is done through development, we don't just uh, replace like for like, but we actually achieve a gain for that. Um, and that is what we refer to as biodiversity net gain. We've been working on this now for quite a few years in Surrey. And this site, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, Priest Hill um, over in Newell, is a really good example of a biodiversity net gain approach. In this particular instance, uh, the development was able to go ahead but an 80 acre nature reserve was also created, which is really, really well used now by the local community. It's grazed um, and managed by the Wildlife Trust, and it is a fantastic site for, um, for invertebrates, for skylarks, um, for rare species. So it's actually wonderful to go and walk through there on a summer's day. And because there's no actual car park adjacent to the site, it's really well used by the local community, community who just access it um, through walking. So this is an example of what we can get right, but it actually making sure that we do that automatically is really important rather than having uh, a struggle to achieve these positive outcomes. One of the things, therefore, that we've been looking at and that we would love to uh, share with our communities is opportunities for delivering nature recovery projects. This is an example of one of those green areas that you saw on the map earlier, one of our biodiversity opportunity areas across the North Downs, where we've mapped the opportunities to create habitat um, and restore that connectivity through the landscape. 
And one example of how that can happen is uh, through the acquisition of land. And this is an example, Pewley Meadows, um, where we were able to purchase the land there that you can see bordered in red. And this was absolutely a community driven approach. The local community approached us with the idea of um, making this acquisition. They asked us for help. Um, there was a local uh, major donor involved as well as the local school. And coming together, we were able to achieve this acquisition in a really, really short period of time. And what's particularly important about that is that piece of land is a really critical jigsaw, connect piece of the jigsaw puzzle connecting um, the existing Pewley Downs Nature Reserve and the fields next door, which the Wildlife Trust is already managing. So this is a great example of, example of how communities can mobilize themselves. And what you can see here are just some examples of the huge variety of opportunities for delivering nature-based solutions, whether it's um, green roofs and green walls, whether it's sustainable urban drainage through uh, rain gardens and swales, Nature-based solutions, as, as Tom's um, IUCN framework articulated earlier, is very much about local solutions driven by local communities. Um, and the, out, the multiple benefits that you can achieve from that are significant. We all know the benefits of wildlife gardening. Um, we have a huge amount of garden in Surrey, over 20,000 hectares. Just by getting that right alone, we not only store huge amounts of carbon, um, but we also provide space for nature to thrive. And I just wanted to touch on the monitoring side of things. So some of you will have seen um, that the Wildlife Trust in partnership with Bug Life, uh, Paints Hill Park and the University of Surrey received over a million pounds worth of funding to develop um, a space for nature tool. Tom mentioned earlier the targets that are likely to be set um, and that we're already looking at delivering um, with the COP coming up at the end of the year. If you have targets, you have to be able to measure those targets to know what your progress is like towards them and whether you're likely to achieve them. And what we hope Space for Nature will help us, help us do is be able to monitor and measure our achievement of those targets at scale, which is going to be a really important um, aspect of what we have to do in the future. If we are going to ask businesses to be able to measure, understand and offset their impacts on biodiversity, we need to have very accurate ways of measuring that so that we can assess that progress. I just wanted to finish by mentioning um, uh, another campaign that's uh, started recently. So you may have seen this already, but this is the People's Plan for Nature. And what I particularly like about this is the fact that it's very much driven by what do people want to see in their local communities in terms of provision of nature and how to look after it. So this is an initiative which has been kick-started by the National Trust, the RSPB and WWF, and you can go online and find out about it. But the idea is to create a people's assembly across the country, um, which will look at creating this people's plan for nature in a very inclusive way. And it would be a great thing for people to get involved with if you're interested. I just wanted to finish by reiterating this point. We cannot function in a healthy way, either economically or societally, if we're not underpinned by a healthy natural environment. And we are here to listen to you and to uh, help you as much as we possibly can to deliver that healthy natural environment in your own local spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah Jane. Um, I have to say, it's really easy to get depressed about what's going on, but some of those messages that you put forward about the local initiatives and how we're connecting together, Fantastic. It's really inspiring. Um, okay, so now um, we're going to change over and we're going to introduce Bryony Carter. She is a community organizing manager for the UK for the Wildlife Trusts. So Hi. welcome, Bryony. Hello. Can you, um, oh, hang on. I haven't put my uh, table in. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you can hear me though, so can't you? I can hear you. Fantastic. I'm 
always really rubbish at these things. So just bear with me one second. Take your time. Slideshow. There we go. Fantastic. So I am going to share my screen now. And um, okay, you can just give and me that a looks look. great. See that that looks perfect. Yep. Ah, um, brilliant. Well, good evening. Thank you so much. It's um, hard to follow on from Sarah Jane. Such a fantastic presentation there. Um, so my name is Bryony Carter, and I am the community organising manager for uh, the Royal Society of Wildlife Trust. So we're sort of the central team um, that work with the other uh, wildlife trusts, including Surrey. Um, and my my role it has Team Wilder there in brackets. You'll see. Um, and it's um, really I'm going to leave on from Sarah's talk to talk about what we are as a movement so that the Wildlife Trust is made up of 46 Wildlife Trusts um, and it's you know sorry you're not alone in doing this and um, we're all coming together as a transformational change in the way that we work as a movement to connect people with nature. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on myself so I'm a qualified ecologist and I worked in conservation projects um, for the first part of my career but really I've dedicated my career to look at how everybody engages um, and accesses nature. Uh, I've actually worked for the movement for about 12 years now which feels a very long time and I started at Shropshire Wildlife Trust um, as a volunteer all the way through to an assistant then a people and wildlife officer and working um, headed up working on community projects but finally my final role before moving to the central team was I was the head of education and learning for the wildlife trust in Shropshire so I've got an experience of working with a full range of groups volunteers corporates farmers the education sector young people but mainly working with local communities um, at that delivery level why is that important well a lot of this is talk is take talking um, all about that, you know, critical information we've learned already this evening and seen from the presentations that making connections with people and making people care is what's going to make the difference. If we're going to critically change people's behaviour, we need to allow them to be part of this, to understand it. And this is where community organising comes in and Team Wilder. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so I've just said two things that some people might think right away, what on earth is she talking about? Um, I've talked about Team Wilder and I've also talked about community organising. So they are essentially exactly the same thing and community organising is Team Wilder. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about community organising in a moment. But uh, Team Wilder is just the name that we are using uh, in the movement as an ethos to represent this area of work. Uh, Team Wilder has been somewhat of a bit of a mystery, insert the mystery man here, you all know the Milk Tray advert. Um, and um, I'm going to talk to you today and unearth that mystery, giving you some insight as to what Team Wilder is and how as a movement we are putting people at the heart of what we do. Just wanted to clarify a few things to start though. This isn't a campaign or project. It is not going to disappear in a couple of years time. It's very much an ethos um, that has formed the DNA of who we are as part of our sort of national strategy that all 46 Wildlife Trusts have signed up to. So this is our work going forward and part of our 30 by 30 ambitions. Why do we need to work in this way? And I'll emphasize the need there. Well, Trusts historically are really good at engaging um, to our warm audiences, I would say, um, that are often our echo chambers. We also like to go and say, hey, we're the Wildlife Trust and we really care about nature and we really care about this, so you should too. And now that works fine if you stay within your safe pond, I call it. But here's the thing, staying in the safe pond isn't going to get us anywhere and isn't going to make those statistics that Tom speaks so passionately about before move in the better direction. So we, as a trust, try and always be the whole orchestra. We try and do everything for everyone because we're amazing. And we end up having no time or capacity or not being able to build relationships and that resilience uh, with our communities it means we stagnate. So community organising, and this is, you know, what Sarah was just talking about, is all about how we empower our communities um, and not tell them what to do, but support them and, and move into a facilitation space. Um, so, yeah, uh, I've got an example that I sort of roll out, which is at the moment, you'll see that I've just shown you there some outputs and a community engagement example but it's essentially would have someone a community come to us and say right we want to plant some trees and um 
traditionally a wildlife trust might go in and go okay that's fine they'll get the trees and they'll put um, on an event and they'll put the posters up and they'll get the event ready and then they'll invite some of the local people to come and plant the trees with them they're like, yeah plant the trees great great day but unfortunately we didn't get all the trees planted on that day so the um, project officer and the reserves officer went back the next day to plant the rest of the trees and then in a little while the community come to the trust and go oh those trees you planted well the kids have been pulling up the uh, the things to you know the the the, the rabbit guards and um, they're they're looking a bit flaggy actually they're not looking great okay well we'll go out and fix that now to move to an empowerment approach would go the community you go in you build relationships you listen to what they want you listen to who they are and you listen to their motivations you then maybe put on some training and show some of the real movers and shakers in that community that want to work on rewilding this area with trees um, and you train them into confidently planting trees and then you might give them a couple of um, tables and some access to your printer to support creating their own event that they then invite you to and you you come along to that event and they're there showing all of their community how to plant those trees and then the whole community get it done but you've also shown them how to manage those trees going forward how to engage some of the young people in that area in a productive and positive way so that they care about it rather than ruining it and actually help build legacy so when we organize we lead change and we support rather than um, going in and telling people what to do Ah, skipping forward. So where did this come from? Where did the word Team Wilder come from? So um, the, uh, well, it all comes from Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Now, I've got to say here, they weren't the first to do community organising. Most trusts are already doing a lot of this work. So they can't take the credit for that. However, they can take the credit for the name. Um, they upped the ante and provided a framework for it. What is important is that they tested this Team Wilder uh, and they trialled the methods and the mechanisms and learnt lessons and fed those lessons back to us as a wider movement. Um, and they can say, look, we've started working this way and it actually is working. They are engaging with different audiences. More people were taking meaningful action for nature. People were building their confidence and staff were seeing a difference too. Um, Debbie Tan, their chief exec, decided to shout about it and go, do you know what? We need to do more on this. And the wider movement listened. So now we've made Team Wilder a central part and it underpin underpins so much of what we do. It also meant I got a job, which is really great. So my role in the central team is to help coordinate and pull together all 46 wildlife trusts, but also the main thing is bring into the light all the amazing work that trusts are doing so that we can share and shout about this learning learning like what's happening in Surrey because you are one of my star trusts not that I have favorites obviously now it's all well and good but this does have to be underpinned with science because we do like science and we like to back up what we're saying so traditionally sometimes just sometimes and it has got better when I started out people engagement work was kind of seen as a little bit fluffy by some of my peers over in conservation and they're like yeah but it's not real science though is it it's not real conservation but you know I'd like to say that that those sort of murmurings of those things have disappeared quite a lot um, but there is the science behind community organizing and that is rooted in behavioral science it looks at how people respond to their environment and what makes that meaningful change in behaviour. And that this goes back to what Tom and Sarah were saying earlier. What is going to make that tipping point for people to change and how we close what we call the value action gap? So if we go around and speak to people, they will all say, well, yeah, I really care about nature. Yeah, it's, re it's really important. I am worried about climate. But do their actions reflect that? Now, the way things are going, not necessarily. So... We want to use behavioural science to and, and community organising to help influence how people's actions match their values. An example of that is um, some. Uh, I was on a, on a on a behavioural science course, and someone said about um, ground nesting bird disturbances, and the biggest problem they had was the reserves officers were trying desperately to not get angry at dog walkers and the dog walkers were scaring all the birds off the nest and it was causing loads and loads of problems and they were putting up notices and they were shouting at people but nothing was changing and they were falling out left right and center so what they decided was to employ a method of community organizing and instead of just getting angry about it they went and spoke to some of the key dog walkers in the area and the main problem was 
dog walking businesses. So they built a network, invited them all of them and said, you know, why do you come here? Why do you, you know, this is a really precious place for, for birds. And they said, well, because it's great. It's really well fenced. So we can let the dogs off and they don't go anywhere. Right. OK. Now, it just so happens, and I know this isn't the same in all cases, that they had an adjacent field that wasn't so sensitive and actually would probably be OK for dogs to go on and didn't have an issue with ground nesting birds. So they built a campaign with the dog walkers to encourage other dog walkers and the public to use that space because it was also fenced and the problem decreased the number of bird disturbances. Now that is a very, very Disney squashy, lovely, nice packaged answer to a problem, but it does illustrate how when you talk to people instead of causing all of these divisions and anger, actually understanding people's motivation. The key thing there was that the reason people really like going to this space was because it was fenced and they were motivated because they liked walking their dogs. What they also did was by having those positive relationships and those positive conversations, they learned about each other. And the dog walkers actually then understood the importance of these ground nesting birds and started to tell the story of why this environment and habitat is so important and became champions for that particular wildlife trust. So that's a good news story. And we want to see more of that happening. So how does this translate across the work we do as a movement? Well, we have to practice what we preach and actually listen to people. So one of my first roles when I when I arrived at the, the central RSWT was to speak to every single wildlife trust and ascertain what they needed and their barriers they face to really understand um, their motivations of how they can support people. That's people on this call I know as well in their local areas and how we can best support as a central team. In order to do, in order to deliver on Team Wilder, we recognise three key areas, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. So we've got Next Door Nature that you'll just see there in the top corner. Um, that's about a, a project that is enabling us to work with new audiences that are disconnected from nature. Our current supporter base, so volunteers, local groups, passionate individuals, people who are already on board and associated with the Wildlife Trust. And then our champions, those who aren't necessarily affiliated, but are out there in those communities. So, um, you know, how Sarah talked about those, those communities that might want to come forward for land acquisitions and the Nature Recovery Network, that sort of thing. And also our house as well, keeping our house in order. So staff themselves and empowering them. So let's go first to Next Door Nature. Um, it's a two year project funded um, by 5 million from the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, in memory now of the Jubilee. This money is really supporting our cultural change across our movement as we embrace community organising. And it is about working with those audiences that are most disconnected from nature. This, um, this does not exclusively mean urban communities. I just want to put that out there because sometimes people get that mixed up. It's working with partners like councils and housing associations, support groups, family centres, etc, to, you know, interact with those that can most benefit from this sort of work. It's very much a people focused programme trying to um, target our goals as our strategic goals, as well as empower, empowering people to take meaningful action for nature and taking pride in where they live. It's about celebrating their stories and their connection to what they know. All 46 wildlife trusts in all four nations are working with over 200 communities and each trust has been enabled to have a community organising officer on the ground um, working in this way. It will give trusts the opportunity to reach out to communities who've generally very un, been very underrepresented in our work and are disconnected from nature. And it's also nameless to have authentic voices coming through our work, which I think is really key. Trust will be listening to what their communities want, not helicoptering in with their own projects. So it's going, and it's also a very diverse project working with all different communities, um, not just like, as I said, urban, but rural as well. There might be some real rewilding in the types of projects that we'll see, but in truth, we don't actually know yet because we're just starting to see what communities will decide for themselves as our trust report back to us what, what uh, our communities want. And with the projects being led and empowered by communities, they should last well beyond the lifetime of this two year programme, leaving a legacy for people and nature. Now, why is it called Next Door Nature and why do we not just call it Team Wilder? Well, 
purely it is team wilder it's the same principles um it's just that the lottery didn't like us using team wilder because it sounded like too much fun so they wanted a different name but after two years next door nature as a project name will cease to exist but all of that learning will then pull through and the reason why there's a picture of a rocket, if you're wondering, is um, the best way to describe how next door nature functions for us in a team wilder context is it's that rocket fuel. So when I talk to all the wildlife trusts, they're like, we really want to do this, but we are really struggling with that staff support to deliver on it. Well, this is an enabling every wildlife trust to have that community organising resource in post to, to feel comfortable with a different way of working. Another really important um, at part of Team Wilder is, is bringing our supporter base with us. Now, there's many people on this webinar, I'll imagine, who will fit into this box. You've got a wealth of knowledge and passion and Team Wilder can't be seen as this newfangled thing that you can't be part of. We want to make sure that we utilise volunteers, local groups and those that support the Wildlife Trust passionately and, and by working with staff to support groups to be brought along with us. Um, Sarah talked about a two-way street. It's absolutely a two-way street. Um, as, as always, what we're doing at the moment is looking at how we take those nature recovery networks and scope them all out and map them and upskill and train these um, supporters in whatever they look like across our wildlife trust to be part of building that nature recovery network. So that is a project that I'm working on. And the beauty of having someone in the central team is that we, we're not out there on the ground delivering every day. So I've got time to pull in all of the best practice from across the movement, including all of the fantastic work that Surrey is doing and using it as best practice examples that can go into loads of resources um, and training and that can be co-created with trust to then you know we can roll that out to all of you guys on the ground so it's a really positive step forward another area is champions that maybe not necessarily affiliated with the wildlife trust but they want to do something and they want to make a difference and what i wanted to do here was um, just show you a video of a local young person from swansea who's currently one of our community champions and hoping this will work so i'm just going to click the link It's not there yet, Bryony. Is it not playing? No, it's not playing. Oh no! Okay, it's playing for me. Sorry about that. Oh, guys. okay, all right. It okay. was we were waiting. <laughs> oh no, we tested this earlier, didn't we? And it worked, but it seems to be not pulling through. And um, what I'll do is I'll put the link to it in the chat, and people can maybe look at them later. Would that be better? Okay, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, can you still see the my back to my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. No Sorry about that. I was sat there like, oh, watching it. <laughs> um, so. One of the ways that we want to support champions, and this is also local supporter groups as well, is I've just talk, talked about one of the biggest problems we have is there's this plethora of amazing knowledge that are kind of trapped in silos in our trust. And we want to unearth and pull these into the light. So we've got a digital um, output project that we're currently working on, which we've been looking, lucky enough to be funded through the Next Door Nature project. And next year, we will see the rollout of a fully accessible digital output. I'm using digital output. It's not a very sexy word, but I don't want to say website or app or something like that because we're in development phase at the moment so I don't want you to go down a rabbit hole of thinking what it might be but what that will do is pull out all of the learning and resource that is out there across the movement and other ENGOs and other champions doing stuff in their local community and pull that into one space where everyone can access um, it's in development and it will be ready next summer and we will support all of our trust to be able to onboard communities signpost and effectively um, allow them to get the best out of this resource uh, it's user led which is is important to to say this is not assuming what people want and it's proper training um, will be will be done to make sure that this is you know properly rolled out so it's not just a, a gimmick if you like um, then the final bit I just want to talk about is our incredible staff. So when we say about working with communities, we've got, you know, I'm so lucky to have such amazing colleagues across the, across the movement. Um, all of our staff in every Wildlife Trust work so hard and 
Team Wilder, when we talk about it, we don't, when we talk about communities, sorry, we don't just mean geographical communities or streets and towns. We talk about communities in, in the literal sense of a bringing together of people. So that could be a farming community, um, a teaching community, councillors, MPs, landowners, you name it. And all of our staff work with all of these different communities and community organising, in brackets, hashtag Team Wilder, that methodology can be utilised by all of our staff to get the best out of being able to facilitate and do more and empower these communities. We're working really hard to make sure that we give everything trust need to roll this out to their staff. So we're currently, um, we have over 100 members of staff from across the movement completing an award in community organising. Um, we're also then going to be putting on a train the trainer scheme so those that really shine as part of this organizing award, award will be empowered themselves to do further training to be able to then utilize this and train staff coming to their own wildlife trust we have a community organizing community of, i've said community a lot this 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 uh, presentation we have a community organizing community of practice which meets monthly and is attended by members of staff from across the movement and this is where we keep everyone updated on training updates and how they can feed into best practice around evaluation of our work spreading um different stories of our work and also colleagues have the opportunity to ask questions we're also building a framework uh, where we're taking again everything that's working really well of integrating and embed embedding community organizing into our staff force and pulling that into a framework that trust can then use and roll out i think that is absolutely everything so in short what we're trying to do and we are on a journey. This is new for us. It's a new way of working is we want to be more representative. So equality, diversion, and inclusion is the heart of everything we do from the language that we use to how we are representing everybody because everybody has a right to be part of this. It means we are listening and moving into a listening space rather than, well, we know best, so we're going to do this because everyone has a role to play using authentic and real voices to represent that, engaging with everybody and being hopeful and positive about the future to build resilience into our work. Thank you for listening. Well, that was fantastic. Um, your enthusiasm is infectious. Um, and so many messages coming through, but one of them for me was very much um, listening, the importance of talking and listening and, and putting into practice what you hear. So thank you so much, Bryony. Okay. Um, we're gonna have a little bit of a, a tiny break, if you will, um, not to go get a cup of tea or anything, but we're gonna have a poll. Um, and so you're gonna shortly see a poll on your screen. And at the bottom, there is a section um, that says other. Now that won't be available for you to type into. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to send out a feedback form after this so that if you have additional information that you would like to share with us or include, you can put it on that form. So we're going to launch a poll and it'll take ooh, 10 seconds. Answer, your, answer the poll and then we will um, take a look at the results before our next, our next speaker. So over to the poll. So all you need to do is type your responses on that. We don't, there we go. We've got some people go ahead and let us know what you think. Um, what type of support does your group need to take action for nature? Uh, you can do more than one if you like. Um, this is really interesting because this will guide us to let us know what you need uh, for what kind of support that you'd like for your group. We've only had a couple of responses. It'll take just a second. Go ahead, let's see what's coming up. Training seems to be top of the leaderboard at the moment. Uh, we've only got about 10 seconds left before you won't be able to, to vote any longer. Um, training still is up there, but, but guidance and getting started seems to be, oh, and, and online platforms are, are coming up. So, so do make sure that we hear from you so that we can um, add that information to this poll. Um, we should be, let's see, well, I'll 
as soon as the poll is finished, we'll get the, um, we've got 79% of you having voted. Let's get up to 100% and see what the overall results are. Uh, almost finished. We're almost there. Just a few more of you voting. Okay, well, it looks, let's see. Here we go, training. Um, not surprisingly, um, training is what really we're all going to need in various forms. But interestingly, online platforms to connect to other uh, working on similar projects has also come up as a, as a top one. So, so interesting. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and again, there will be a feedback form at the end of um, this webinar that you can give us additional information if you like. So with that, I think what we're going to be doing is um, handing over to three people from the Guilford Environment Forum, Helen, Claire, and James. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Helen Harris, and I'm a member of Guilford Environmental Forum, or, or GEF, which is a uh, local community environmental organization here in Guildford um, and I'm here with my colleagues um, Claire and James who will talk to you in a minute about a couple of our projects but I'm going to start off just giving you an overview of uh, what we do at GEF. So uh, GEF exists really to try and make Guildford a bit more of a sustainable environmentally friendly place and um, that gap that Bryony was talking about, that shark infested gap between our values and our actions, we really try and look at getting people across that gap to take some practical action for nature here in Guildford. So we categorize that in terms of cherish, which is actually physically getting out there, doing something, talking to people around the natural environment and sustainability in Guildford. Uh, Engage, which is working with local leaders and influencers that we try particularly to uh, speak to and work with to drive change in Guildford. And then Inform and Inspire, which is sharing information um, and getting people feeling inspired to, to get active. We have just over 400 members here in Guildford, uh, but some of those are residents associations and parish councils. So we like to think we've got a decent reach. We put out a regular newsletter with articles on current issues and um, things that we're thinking about for all our members, just to try and keep environmental issues that are current and um, at top of people's mind really here in Guildford and we also send out more regular MailChimp updates and organise talks and events so for example um, we organised a bat walk around Guildford recently went out with our bat detectors and went and saw what species of bat were living down by the river and even in the little groups of trees down there people found out there were loads of bats and we're really excited to know that they were there right in the town centre um, we also engage regularly with our borough council in Guildford to try and keep environmental issues top of their mind. Uh, one of our key aims, as I think um, Tom was mentioning at the beginning, one of our key aims is to try and get Guildford to have a really good biodiversity action plan and also to support them in responding to the climate emergency and having targets and action plan around that. Um, Another recent campaign for us in, 2000, in, in 2021 was a pesticide-free town in Guildford. So we were able to run a petition um, around Guildford, got on, out on the streets talking to people about glyphosate and other pesticides and why we think they're really damaging and should be used a whole lot less um, in how we manage our land personally and as a, as a town. Um, and our, we got enough, enough um, signatures that we were able to take that to the council, present to the councillors, um, and we actually got a unanimous vote, which is brilliant to go pesticide free here in Guildford within three years. So that has now translated into us setting up a working group with the council where we're looking at how we actually test alternative methods of managing green spaces in Guildford without the use of pesticides, get those results, share them more widely. We're looking to set up a stakeholder group so that we can get more land managers around Guildford involved in that pesticide free action. And also we work with um, the zero carbon building in Guildford, which is a brilliant display, display space. If you haven't been in, please visit it. Um, so we're able to put up physical displays there to educate people around the issues and um, get people hopefully individually engaged in going pesticide free in their own gardens as well. So it's kind of taking it down all those levels. 
So I've told you about going pesticide free. That's one of our areas of activity. And I'm now gonna hand over to um, Claire, who will talk about our amazing community garden, the Rosamond Community Garden, which is just on the outskirts of Guildford. Hi. Hello. Um, so I'm Claire Millington um, and I'm a volunteer, long-standing volunteer at the Rosamond Community Garden, um, along with Helen Harris and, and lots of other lovely volunteers. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about the garden and, and let you know what we, we're doing there. Um, Rosamond Community Garden is a 19 acre site of Chalk Downland in the Surrey Hills near to Pewley Downs. Um, the land is now connected through to Pooley Downs and provides an important protected corridor for biodiversity in this area. Um, the top two acres were made into a community garden in 2010 and is managed by volunteers and the local community. Um, the garden uses organic and no dig methods to grow vegetables, fruit and herbs for the volunteers and community and works in tune with wildlife, providing a rich habitat for a wide variety of birds, insects and animals. The remaining 17 acres has been managed with uh, support from Surrey Wildlife Trust to improve biodiversity um, through using cattle grazing. Um, so every 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 year we're running, they're running their belted galloways through through the land, and um, we're also doing a lot of scrub clearing. Um, and in conjunction with the Surrey Wildlife Trust team, our volunteers have enjoyed work days where we've cleared large areas of invasive blackthorn and hawthorn using tree poppers. We also have a group who've been trained in lookering by the trust. Um, this is an age old skill of daily checking and observing the grazing cattle while they're in our meadows and um, reporting any problems back to the team. It's been a really popular project with the team and has resulted in some amazing photos of the fields in autumn and winter. Uh, Rosamond Garden is open to everyone wishing to enjoy the peace and quiet of this beautiful space and we're working to raise awareness of growing sustainably for the future while maintaining the wildlife habitats. Um, we have connections with Zero Carbon Guildford who have um, helped us with our building projects and we're also hoping to grow food for their community fridge. There are many projects to get involved in at the garden with regular work parties to tend the plants or learn new skills. Um, there are two wildlife ponds which are works in progress where our volunteers have learned about different species needs and planting for wet and dry seasons. Our newest pond was funded with support from the Surrey Wildlife Trust team um, who've also been on board with advice for the project and been really helpful. Um, we have two polytunnels to increase our growing seasons, a very productive orchard and soft fruit cage, willow stands for coppicing, and a large amount of comfrey for composting and plant food. Um, we're also starting to look at uh, different techniques and ways of storing water and um, irrigating um, our crops. <coughs> um, once a year we run a very popular apple pressing event which brings the community get together at the garden to both raise awareness of the space and funds for equipment and plant food. Um, and once the um, we are currently running sustainable building courses where people have learned to use cob and stone to build our new shelter and classroom. Um, the garden, garden is scythed once a year at the end of summer, and this is also run as a course for local people to learn this very enjoyable skill. Um, another project has been to build a sustainable compost toilet, uh, which is called a tree bog. Uh, this was something that I found in a, in a permaculture magazine and it's come to life. Um, at last, and we're really, really proud of it, um, where we can use a fast growing willow species to digest the waste and therefore negate the lead, need to clear out the chamber and you don't need any water there. Um, we welcome newcomers to the garden and we're completely open to anyone wanting to bring new ideas and projects to the space. We hope that next year we will be able to offer our new building, the hub for local groups to use as a set of courses or as a meeting space. We currently have a membership of 35 volunteers and have won Surrey Wildlife Trust Best Community Garden in 2019 with a gold for the wildlife category in Guildford in Blue this year. If you'd like to get involved or visit the garden, do email us on guildfordcommunitygarden at gmail.com or visit our website or Facebook page. Thanks very much for giving us this opportunity to speak to the community. And I'd like to hand over to James Sinclair to speak about the Mount Project. Hi there. Um, so we just wanted to, to briefly also mention a, a new project that we're 
um, undertaken uh, with GEP. And this is this is the Mount Volunteers. Um, so the Mount, for those who don't know it, uh, is a series of north uh, facing fields of chalk downland stretching from Guildford uh, up onto Hogsback, uh, as well as having great views from there. It forms a, a rare and a highly biodiverse habitat. Um, these chalk hills were lightly grazed for centuries, giving rise to a, a highly diverse and competitive flora with up to 40 species per square metre. Uh, and this in turn has provided an important habitat for numerous insect species, including rare butterflies and uh, nesting sites for skylarks and, and other ground nesting birds. Um, so yes, um, important conservation work has been carried out for some time by particularly butterfly conservation and also Guildford Borough Council who, who own and manage the site. Uh, there is though a, a huge amount to be done on this quite expensive site that is 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 now you know relatively overgrown, uh, especially by uh, hawthorn, which is is crowd, crowding out the sort of the diversity of other plants. Um, so working with with the council, a group of log, local volunteers have come together with the aim of uh, maintaining and improving this rare site for nature. Um, so what have we done so far? Um, so significant logistical, advisory, and coordinating work with. With the council, who've been brilliant, I have to say, and other groups, um, getting to understand the ecology of the site, deciding on work plans, drumming up volunteers, and less exciting things like insurance and tools. You know, it has taken a considerable time, but it's really been worth it, especially now we're we're getting underway. Um, we held our first uh, volunteering session in July, which was a great success, with more than 25 volunteers attending. Um, you know, where we, after sharing this, really the aims of the project. Um, and, and doing a bit of learning about local flora and fauna, um, we, we carried out a flora survey, um, trying to give a, a, a baseline for future monitoring of the site over time. Going forward, I aim this, this to be a, a multi-year long-term project, helping to enhance this important and beautiful site. Um, and believe me, there is a huge amount of work to do. So community involvement and, and enthusiasm will be key. Um, and we aim to build a motivated group reaching out not only to local residents, but also to other potentially interesting groups, such as the university, who are hopefully coming along shortly with the next group, and also local businesses. Um, we've already got two new sessions planned, one for this Sunday with um, over 30 signed up, and, uh, and another one in November, uh, where we're proposing to move on to the more manual work of removing the hawthorn, you know, which will hopefully you know, reduce the need for pesticides, and, and, and we also may potentially do some scrapes. Uh, from then on, we'll continue working probably on a monthly or six weekly basis through the winter um, until nesting season. Just briefly to, to, to finish, I wanted to just highlight a, uh, highlight a couple of um, tips from our first sort of, well, six months or year we've been uh, sort of planning this. Firstly, really identifying the right opportunity uh, where a volunteer group can potentially make a difference. Um, we think this may you know, particularly be where if you can identify an, uh, an area of high biodiversity value, uh, where there is a gap between current and potential conservation work. Um, in our case, we, we partnered with the local council, but there's like to be similar opportunities with, with charities or, or private held land. Secondly, speaking to, to others who have, who have carried out similar projects um, and can give great advice on how to run the scheme, uh, provide conservation advice, uh, and also vitally um, share tools. So in our case, the council, but also butterfly conservation and uh, the Puli Down volunteers who are a long-standing group uh, who have a similar project elsewhere in Guildford. And finally, drumming up our volunteers, it's really helped to utilise existing networks such as GEF, and also simply selling to as many friends, families and colleagues as, pos as possible until hopefully they uh, turn up and, and get hooked. Anyway, if you're interested in joining or, or replicating elsewhere, please do get in touch. I think the, uh, the, the, the Guildford Environment Forum um, details will be um, on the slides. Thank you. What a fantastic success story. Um, really, really impressive. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so before we go on to our final speaker, I just wanted to remind you that we do have um, question and answers available for all of the panelists at the end of the session. So please do send those questions in if you like through the Q&A um, button on the bottom. So for our final speaker this evening, I'd like to introduce Keith Lightfoot and he's from the Unstead Community Group. My name's Keith Lightfoot. I'm the volunteer warden for Unstead uh, Wetland Nature Reserve. Um, and the story really started in lockdown in the summer of 2020, when we were all allowed to have a, a, an exercise walk. And my exercise walk took me past this what used to be a, a nature reserve, but was in a, 
a sad state. It was um, really overgrown. Uh, there was no water on the reserve. And um, the more I looked at it, the more I realized that we needed to do something about it. Um, now I volunteer with Surrey Wildlife Trust. I also volunteer with, with RSPB. And uh, between us, we've got quite a network of guys that were in the same state that I was. We were having an exercise walk, but we were twiddling our thumbs. We were keen to get out and do some work. But during lockdown, organizations like the RSPB and Surrey Wildlife Trust weren't allowed to do anything. Um, so I managed to get together with a local birding group that used to use the reserve and offered our services, if you like, suggested that if I could get maybe half a dozen volunteers to get together to see whether we could try and restore some water to the reserve and see what would happen. Um, and that was, that was the approach I took originally, was just to suggest to a few guys that I volunteered with, how about coming down for a couple of days and seeing what we can do. Um, little did I know that it would lead to what it's led to now, but um, that's, that's the way it went. We got in touch with a local bird group. They, they agreed to let us have a go. Um, we didn't, at that time, speak to the Thames Water at all. We didn't, didn't mention what we were trying to do. It was purely an independent uh, effort to try and restore some water to the reserve. And that's where the journey started. And I've been amazed really how, how quickly it's, it's taken off. In the last two years, how much this group of guys and girls have, have achieved. I'm amazed every time I look at it. Um, and it wasn't until we really started that we realized what, how much work there was required. We thought by restoring a little bit of water to the reserve, everything else would happen. But that literally just wasn't the case. So this is where the reserve is. It's a little village called Unstead. It's in between uh, Godalmin and Guildford. And it's actually on Thames water land. It's owned by Thames Water and it's adjacent to the Godalmin sewage treatment works. On the right hand side, the, the map on the right, you can see the extent of the reserve. It's, it's not very big, it's about 25 acres. And the blue arrows indicate where the water comes from the sewage works onto the reserve. Now you, can, you can imagine this is what it should look like, but in reality, none of that water was flowing. So the lagoons were dry, the North Meadow was dry, uh, and everything was just starting to regrow. Succession of trees were moving in, and the whole area was just drying out. So we started in, in September of, of 2020 during the lockdown, and we, we this is what the North Meadow looked like when we first started. You can see this, this should be full of water. From the fence line onwards, that, that, that uh, is a, an area that was designed to hold water and for, for scrapes for, for wading birds. And this is what we found when we, when we started. There's a hide on the bank. So this viewpoint looks from the hide. And the hide was in a bit of a sorry state. The roof had uh, been damaged by fallen trees and it needed a bit of uh, tender love and care. And that's the view from the back of the, the North Meadow, where you can see there's a power line in the distance. That's looking back from that perspective. Through a lot of hard work and clearing the trees that, that are encroached onto the, uh, the meadow and then getting the water supply back, this is what it looked like in March of 2021. We did some uh, TLC to the hide and got the roof repaired and gave it a good coat of preservative. And that's again looking from the rear end of the uh, the North Meadow, looking back towards the the hide. We then had to decide what we were going to do from this point onwards. So we thought that the best way of going about it was to establish a new group. Uh, so we set up ourselves as as a new management group for the for the reserve. We put together a lot of policy documents, and we established a, a group of trustees. And this was our first trustees meeting. We got Peter on the left who does our, all our data recording, Janet, our secretary, yours truly next, Chris is our treasurer, John, the chairman, and Stuart, who is a, a QM and a Mr. Fixer, if you like. He does pretty much everything he can. We come from a variety of backgrounds, but all of us, for, for whatever reason, we're all passionate about trying to get this little reserve back up and running again. And, uh, it was, it was just amazing how quickly we all gelled together and worked together. 
But what we do need to do is to look to the future. It's not just the, the nature reserve that we need to restore. We need to make sure that the management team and the trustees and the volunteer group are sustainable. So we need to look for the next 20 years to get some new blood in, some younger people in. And that's, that's our emphasis for the next uh, part of the show, I think, is to try and get as many young people involved as we can. <clears throat> in order to persuade Thames Water that it was a serious venture, we had to put together a five-year plan for the management of the reserve. Uh, and our aims were to create a, a variety of habitats. We, we've established open waters of area. There's wet woodlands, dry meadows, marshy fens. Um, and over the first few years, we've planted new hedgerows and trees, and we've rejuvenated existing hedges by lane and creating coppice areas of coppice woodland. We have plans for this coming autumn and winter to create more woodland areas in the works field with a Mia Wacky Forest. This, this is a Thames Water Initiative, um, a small mixed native orchard and a hazel coop, which will routinely coppice over six or seven year interval. We will also be creating new hedgerows, planting blackthorn thickets, clearing willow to create more open water and gapping up old hedges with new plants. Our future plans, We'll also be working with closely with Thames Water Biodiversity Team and their subcontractors to create another area of wetland aimed specifically at encouraging wading birds to the, to the site. Actually, that work has just started this week. The contractors have moved in with heavy machinery. Um, we're expecting it to be quite a mess initially, but hopefully it's all for the better good. And this will be on the eastern end of the South Meadow. And um, once finished, we'll add approximately another hectare of wetland to the reserve. These are some of the volunteer tasks we've done over the, over the last couple of years. That, but the top photograph was clear in the North Meadow. Uh, we didn't realize that Thames Water didn't want us to have fires, but when they saw this, um, this photograph, we were quickly told that we couldn't have fires. So we now have to use all of the brash in dead hedging and making willow screens. Uh, the bottom photograph, building bug hotels, uh, turn rafts, uh, that was the first trustee meeting, barn owl boxes, clearing footpaths, planting the new hedgerow, and coppicing and cutting back willow. We've got the Surrey Amphibian Rec Park group involved. Um, we've done small mammal trapping. We survey for butterflies, moths, uh, routine records for birds. Um, so we're interested in not just, it used to be a bird inside, but we're interested in all of the uh, invertebrates, mammals, birds, everything that uses the, the reserve. We're trying to create a database of everything that's on the reserve so we can look back and see how much we've improved things over the years. So we've got a great team of volunteers. We've got about 15 guys we, we regularly see. We might get as many as eight on a, on a routine um, work party. The top photograph was when we planted trees last winter. I think we had something like 21 volunteers planting trees. Uh, these are some of the tasks we've done. And recently we managed to get Surrey Wildlife Trust involved in helping us to mow our meadow. Um, I think there was 27 volunteers on that joint effort, which was a, a brilliant day. Community engagement. <laughs> the easy part is the hard physical work of, of the practical tasks. The hard part for me is the organizational um, administration, setting up a new organization, establishing a constitution, privacy policy, health and safety documents, risk registers, all of that. Um, we applied for a, a charitable status, which we've uh, now achieved. And in doing that, we, we I think proved to Thames Water that we're really serious about the, uh, the reserve and Luckily, they've, they've taken on board what we're trying to do and helping us with huge um, financial support and practical support. Um, so, yeah, huge thanks to Thames Water. I think that one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that there's a lot of help out there. If you ask um, people like Surrey Wildlife Trust, people like the RSPB, um, SARG, Sorry, Bird Club. We've we've taken advice from from 
various numbers of organizations out there. So there's a huge wealth of uh, experience and knowledge out there. So don't be frightened to go out and ask. And normally, uh, you know, we get a positive response. Very, very rarely have we had little or no uh, positive response coming back. And a big thanks again, like I say, to Thames Water for their continued support. And uh, we've had great support from Surrey Wildlife Trust, particularly their community engagement team. Like I said, we've, we've had uh, help and guidance from RSPB, Guildford RSPB group. All of these groups have offered practical help in surveying and monitoring various species uh, on the reserve, and we're only too keen to share their extensive knowledge with us. Uh, in terms of communication, we, uh, we developed a, a little brochure for the reserve. Um, we've got a monthly newsletter that goes out to all the members. Uh, we've got around about 100 members at the moment. Uh, so they get a news, copy of the newsletter electronically every month, which gives them updates of the stuff that's going on, things that have been seen on the reserve, the stuff that volunteers are doing. We also have a, a Facebook group. We've got a Flickr group where a lot of the photographs are stored. So if anybody takes any photographs they want to share, that's done through that. Um, we've got a WhatsApp group for the volunteers and a website. So uh, anybody out there can have a look at it. Um, it's, a, it's a great way of sharing information and getting out to the wider community, not just the local community. And of course, emails, we email our volunteers and, uh, and members with regular updates. There's a, I don't know, there seems to be quite a fear about social media these days, uh, but I think it's been a huge help to us, uh, particularly Facebook groups where we shared, shared sightings of uh, birds and mammals, uh, amphibians and reptiles that we've seen on the, on, the, on the site. So I wouldn't be too frightened of using social media in, in a controlled fashion, and it gets out to a, a much wider community very, very quickly. Um, and I think if they're used in a careful and controlled way, it can be very beneficial in getting the message to hundreds of similar minded people. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, check out the website. If you do a search on Unstead Reserve, it will take you to the website. It contact us if you'd like to look around the reserve. It's public, uh, free, free access to the, most of the reserve, not all parts of the reserve. But if you want a guided tour, I'm happy to show people around, either individually or in a group. If you belong to another community group and you'd like to share experiences, we'd be happy to listen to that. If you'd like to join us on volunteering days, by all means, just get in touch and come along. We volunteer regularly every Thursday and the second Sunday of the month. And if there's anything we can help you with, um, just go th through the web page on the Who's Who page and you get my or one of the other trustees' email address and just contact us. Right, this last slide, I hope this works. This was a, a visit, we, a few of us went down onto the reserve and this is really why um, we do the work we do. This was a dawn chorus on May the 1st this year. So if, you, if this works, you should hear the dawn chorus. It lasts for about a minute. So you might want to turn the volume up and uh, just take a minute of a uh, nice bird song. Well, Keith, what a lovely way to finish up a really good evening. Thank you Thank so you much. Very much. 
And you. what what an achievement. Um, your, your group really has achieved quite a bit. And thank you very much for sharing all that. I think it's an inspiration for us all. Okay. Um, so, so that brings us to a conclusion, but um, what we'd like to do is, I know we've run a little bit over time, but we thought we'd, um, if necessary, we'd open up the, uh, the floor to some questions and we can stretch um, out our time for a, a few minutes longer. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. So I'm gonna jump right into those if that's okay. Um, Peter Cornish, this is a question for you, Tom. So let's see, am I jumping ahead? Do we need all of our uh, panelists available for our questions? Um, because Tom, this one's for you. Um, okay. There's a great analysis of the problem and what's needed to reverse current trends. Given the audience, I think we're all committed to doing what we can locally. However, how do we ensure the full and committed support policies from national government? That's a lovely question. Yeah. I think lots of us have been working on trying to do that for a long time. And I think we thought we'd got to a point where climate was no longer a political issue. I think it's really important that these things uh, go beyond politics, that we get to the point where a vibrant, healthy environment that's supporting our communities is not a political issue anymore to pass to one party or another, that it's something that we all work for. Um, irrespective of who we vote for or who's in power. We don't seem to be in that position right at the minute. Um, and, and I think that's a real shame. So how do we engage? I think uh, stand up and be heard. Um, in all of the work that we've just yeah. heard about, there's huge opportunities to shout about that. I mean, it's fantastic what we've just heard about, really inspiring and uh, talking to your neighbours about it, talking to your community about it, talking to, you know, communicating. Yes, if social media is your thing, communicate it on social media. Let's be loud about all of this stuff and proud about what we're doing here and what you're all doing and achieving. I think it's fantastic. And the more we can do that, the better. And then, yeah, if it's your thing to go out and get involved on the street and, and become, you know, and, and shout about it, then by all means, you know, go for it. Right to protest absolutely support i feel uncomfortable doing that personally so i choose to do it a different way by writing letters and bringing up people and and so on i think we find our way let's get heard it's really important this is not a political issue this is a issue that should be just accepted like universal education for everybody like yeah good air quality for everybody this should not be a political piece that's passed from one part, party to another I couldn't agree more. Oh, uh, Helen, did you want to say something? I would just share that um, when we speak to our local councillors and the officers in the council at a local government le level, uh, they always express that they hear a lot of um, sort of bad news and complaints from people about, you know, what's not working. But they hear very little about, you know, if they've changed a mowing regime to let, let grass grow longer or you know made a change that's positive for nature a lot of us would look at it and think oh that's great but we don't actually email them and say thank you <laughs> that's great and I just think if, if they hear more of us expressing how much we like that kind of thing then they will be feel inspired to do more too very good uh, outstanding um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Sophie has asked you Helen um, how did Helen get the pesticide free campaign started Um, okay, sorry, my doorbell's just gone, so apologies for the background noise. Um, so we started it, um, we actually started it by in two ways. One was by looking at how we could, um, how we could, as a group, share our thoughts and kind of make a position statement on pesticides and why we thought it was important to get that articulated well into a short piece that we so we could all talk about it consistently and effectively and our second way was by trying to identify who locally was in a position to make a change so which councillors did we need to individually go and speak to and see what they thought about what might be involved um, 
And then once we had done that and it's kind of agreed a plan of action, then we were able to put together a petition and go out and just, we actually found the best way to do it was just go out on the street and stop people and start talking. And it was actually really enjoyable. We met some great people um, and we started talking to them about why we thought pesticides were just an outdated way of managing you know weeds and why weeds aren't even weeds they're, they're little plants that are really courageous and um we had some really good conversations oh, it's it's excellent it proves that all you have to do is start a conversation and things can happen uh thank you for that um chris howard i think this might be for keith um how did you finally get thames water engaged I um, putting together a, a program of works and a, and a management plan and speaking to them. I mean, Janet, our secretary, she's been brilliant. She's been continually, even before we started, she, she's a local resident. And I think one of the reasons she moved there was she knew that there was a nature reserve on the doorstep. And um, <clears throat> the response that we've had from the local residents has been brilliant. So we, she's, she'd been in contact with Thames Water for, for years before we got started. Um, and I think we, all we had to do really was to prove to them that we were serious in what, we, what our intentions were. And the way to do that was to put a management plan together, put proposals together, put work programs together so that they could see that we were there for you know, the next five years, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, just prove that we were serious, really. Perfect, perfect. Um, well, they, I think you must have covered your topics very clearly because we don't seem to have any other questions coming in. So I just want to thank each and every one of our panelists, as well as all of you that have joined us on this webinar tonight. I hope it's food for thought um, that you'll take back to, to your local communities and, and be able to implement some of that. Um, I want to remind you that we do have the next uh, webinar in this series, next the Wednesday the 9th of November, but this one's gonna be from 3.30 until 5.30, and that's talking about increasing habitat diversity in your local area. Um, and uh, so, so again, thank you very much. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you again in the future and have a really lovely evening. <laughs>